He fed us. We hung out. I mean, he showed us what a black belt is supposed to be and how a black belt is supposed to conduct themselves. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 145, and thanks for tuning in. On this episode, we hear from a passionate instructor, Mr. Kevin Galloway. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on the traditional martial arts, twice a week. Welcome. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host of the show and the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out. I hope you enjoy your time with us. Today, we're announcing a brand new sparring gear colorway, Horizon. This is our first release using our exclusive unique dip color process, which guarantees that every single piece of gear is a little different from the rest, just like you. Horizon is a slick blue and white blend that I know is going to be well received. Check it out or the rest of our colors at whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's also the easiest place to sign up for our newsletter. In each of the issues, we send out special content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Way back on episode 31, we had the chance to hear from a good friend of the show, Mr. Corey Rose. Since then, he's been every bit as good of a friend, and today's guest comes from that friendship. Mr. Kevin Galloway is a longtime practitioner of both karate and taekwondo, now operating a school and hosting a competition in Oklahoma. Mr. Galloway opens up about life, his family, his students, and what makes a good instructor. The stories he tells today range from the emotional to the humorous, and you'll probably find yourself laughing along, and maybe even tearing up a bit. Let's welcome him. Mr. Galloway, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much, sir. It is an honor to be on your show. It's an honor to have you. You were referred to us by past guest of the show, Mr. Corey Rose, who I'm trying to remember when he was on. It's been a little while. He's sent us a few guests, and if we have as much fun, if I have as much fun talking to you as I have to him and, and to the others that have come from our talking to him, then then this will be a great episode. So I thank you for your time. He is a good young man. He is a very good young man. And we'll run into each other at Century and talk for hours. Well, that's that's... Not quite a four-letter word on this show, but that's okay, <laughs> <laughs> because we can't sell everything. And you know what? Um, Century's done a tremendous right. service to the martial arts industry, and even though we are competitors, um, you know, it's it's fun because I'm, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken with the president, I've spoken with some of the vice presidents, and, and we have a pretty good relationship because there's more than enough to go around. And just as there are different martial arts, there are different ways to serve the martial arts community. And we'll kind of leave that there. But this awesome. this isn't about that. This isn't about me or, or Century or, or any anything else. This is about you. And so we want to know who you are and how you got started and everything. And that's really the best place for us to start that conversation. How did you get started in the martial arts? I got started in the martial arts in 1976 um, under the teaching of Phil Perkins, the late Phil Perkins. Uh, he was my first martial arts instructor. He was under Grandmaster Huang, who is Taekwondo. Uh, Mr. Perkins, however, was a Gojiru person. Back in the 70s, the Gojiru people were marrying the Taekwondo people because Gojiru had incredible hands and the Taekwondo people had incredible kicks. And those two got together like nobody's business. Uh, Grandmaster Huang still talks about Bill Perkins, and he has been, he's left this earth many, many, many years ago. And uh, take what, that's the only school that was available in McAllister, Oklahoma, Go Buffaloes. And that's how I got started. Wow. So there's the how. How about the why? Um, that's a little less complicated. I was playing football. I like hitting people. And um, me and the coach did not see eye to eye on things. And I tried to resolve the issue, and the issue came with more condemnation. 
And afterwards, I was like, you know, um, it's a big world out there. I don't have to do this. And they were having a martial arts demonstration, and they were giving away free lessons. So I put my little name in the hat, and they called me and said, hey, you won. And I've been hooked ever since. Really? Wow. So, you know, it, it sounds like just as so many of our guests, so many of, of our listeners, too. I mean, I know I was in, I'm included in this. We needed martial arts at the time that we found it. And I mean, that you pretty much just lined that up for us. But what was it that kept you training? I mean, if you've been training since 1976, you, you must love it. You, there's got to be something about it. And that reasoning may have changed over the years. But what was the reasoning that kept you sticking around those early years? It's just, I mean, I was a Bruce Lee fan like everybody else. But it's just fascinating. I mean, it's through the years. I mean, I was I was a, a purist, you know, take one of those, the only legal art on the surface of the planet, and if you're doing anything else, it's inferior. Well, through the years, I found that that's not quite true. I met a kung fu guy for the first time at a tournament, and I won the match through reputation. The judges knew who I was. They did not know who the young man I was fighting was, so therefore they weren't calling his points and things like that. That young man kicked my tail and made me like it. <laughs> he was phenomenal. And I was like, there's something else out there that can, that can cause, cause, cause a challenge. And so it's, it's just when it, and it's really not the art, it's the instructor. When the instructor knows what he's talking about, has had some experience fighting, uh, uh, self-defense, it doesn't make any difference what the experience is can lead you along the correct path. Mr. Perkins took us to tournaments. He fed us. We hung out. I mean, he showed us what a black belt is supposed to be and how a black belt is supposed to conduct themselves. And that just stuck. And even after his passing, and I've had several instructors between him and I'm now part of the Wild Bunch organization, it's just, you can tell a real black belt. They don't get too excited. They don't get too low, don't get too high. But what they have is the confidence to resolve any conflict. And up until, I'm just going to walk away. And I needed that. I needed someone to show me how to conduct yourself, not only as a martial artist, but how to conduct yourself as a man. Wow. Um, you know, we could almost end right there, right? Because we we just hit such an incredible bit of wisdom. And I think that you've done as good a job as any articulation on what the goal of a martial artist should be. You know, that personal development, that that the way that we conduct ourselves as martial artists in the world. And I hope that if that didn't hit any of the listeners like a ton of bricks upside the head, that you'll roll back the last 90 seconds and listen to it again, because I found it pretty powerful. And I thank you for sharing it. Thank you. So I think this gives us a pretty good idea. And, and you and I have chatted on the phone before for actually quite a while. Um, <laughs> listeners, one of the things that a lot of you don't know is that sometimes when these interviews are set up, um, I'll reach out and I'll, I'll talk to somebody on the phone you know, just to get a sense, do they speak well enough and, and long-winded enough that we're going to get an episode out of it? I, I don't want to put episodes out that are seven minutes in in length for an interview. And we've had some people that I've talked to that would have been that short. Now, of course, Mr. Galloway, you, you are not one of those people. We had quite a lengthy conversation last, was it last week? And and I yes, really enjoyed did. it. So that that's why you're back. That's why we're doing this. And I think we've got enough context. Let's keep rolling here. You told me quite a few great stories when we were on the phone before, and I'm sure you've got plenty more. Let's indulge the listeners. Tell us your best martial arts story. Most of my good martial arts stories uh, are me getting beat. In other words, um, I fancy myself a fairly decent fighter, uh, fancy myself a fairly fast hand, and so back fist was my, was my uh, 
introduction of choice. And me and a very good friend of mine who's uh, with the Wild Bunch as well, we were fighting for first and second. And I was like, okay, I'm faster than Roger. I'm going to go ahead and just hit with the back fist and, and we're, we're going to be done. And I danced around, you know, kind of jabbing, playing around everything. And I pushed off and slipped. And as I pushed off, my head landed right in front of him. He taps me on the forehead. The judges say break. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. It did not end like that. I slipped and got scored. And he didn't hit me hard. He was like, your head's right there. I just tapped it. And I, I, I was like, okay, well, maybe next time. <laughs> I'm struck with 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 your humor and and the way you look at that situation and just kind of it, it sounds like you're shrugging it off. Maybe in the moment you were feeling a little more emotional about it. But, oh yeah. Okay. So tell us about that. Well, I mean, when you're fighting for first and second, everybody's adrenaline's pumping and everything, and um, if you calm down, you'll be all right. But I was going to be faster than fast, and being faster than fast is not necessary. All you have to be is a little faster than the other guy. Well, I was I was gonna I was gonna you know go out in a blaze of glory, and pushing off on the surface that we were on, which was carpet, my foot slipped, and it made me do like a lunge direct in front of him, and I'm thinking he's gonna roundhouse me in the face. He's gonna because I'm I'm in a total defenseless position and for him just to lean forward and tap me on the head i was like that is that 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 didn't just happen it didn't just happen but it did and you can't take yourself too seriously i i mean i've won tournaments i've lost more tournaments than i've than i've won but it's okay it's okay he and i are still friends i enjoy seeing him he enjoys seeing me but it was just at one time i was like oh my goodness that you really got to have it, you really want it. And not only did you lose, you lost with just a simple tap on the head. Do you think there's a, a connection between that story and the way that you articulated what a black belt is? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Connect, connect because, those dots for us. Well, you, you, you can't take yourself too seriously. Um, well, let me back up. I don't see a problem with striving for perfection. You can ask any of my students, are you going to be, for your black belt test, you're going to show me as perfect a technique as you can muster up. Is it going to be perfect? No. Is it okay to strive for perfection? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's no reason not to. It does have a limit. At midnight, 1201, that day is history and you get a chance to build on the next day. So it does have a limit, but you, 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 it's okay to strive for perfection. It's okay not to be perfect, but as long as you're trying to work to have more, do more, be more, give more, that's where you want to be. When you can do that, and when you win, you go, praise God. And when you lose, you go, praise God. That's fine. It's totally okay. You don't have to be the best of the best of the best as long as you're trying. Right on. I like that. I like the way you worded that. Now, obviously, martial arts is a huge part of your life. You've been practicing since 1976. I mean, that, that's quite a while. Certainly, this is, if it, maybe we can say it is your life, or at the very least, a huge portion of your life. But I'm sure you've got other stuff that you're engaged in. Do you have any other hobbies or things that you're passionate about? Oh, I also do music. I uh, sing, play keyboard, keyboards. Um, when I get a chance, I like to go fly my kite. Uh, I am totally, totally, totally into cars. Um, I, I, I have a, a, a lots of things that I like to do. Uh, I like to work out in martial arts and in physical training, weightlifting. So. There's, there's, 
I like training. So if someone comes to me saying, hey, I need help with A, B, and C, uh, I've got a problem with A, B, and C. I like doing research to see how we can find a cure to the problem. Uh, I've done tons and tons and tons of research. Uh, I've worked with uh, Master Tran on breath healing. So I did that so that none of my karate kids would have to go to the doctor. I can I can figure out what's going on and try to get them healed. So there's 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 a lot going on. Um, it's just, I mean, taking care of your students, making sure that they're fine, making sure that they're they're safe, making sure they can do what they need to do. Uh, go see them when they're in different plays and and when they're performing and things like that. That those supporting my students, those are the things that I enjoy. And some of time, sometimes the students that haven't been with me for years and years and years is students who have graduated from high school, students that graduated from college. I get the invitation to go, and if there's any, if there's not a conflict in scheduling. I absolutely try to go. Once you're KMG martial arts, you're always KMG martial arts. Mm -hmm. So early on, as you were talking about your original instructor and the impact that he had on your life, you know, I was really struck with how much more than simply a martial arts instructor he was for you. And it seems like you're embodying that now for your students. Absolutely. Why do you think that's important? It's something that I think most, if not all, good martial arts instructors would agree on. But I don't know that everyone recognizes how and why. Because of the world we live in, uh, the world we live in is is, is not kind. Um, it's tough. And when you have a student who's 12, 13, reaching puberty, starting to come into their own, you have to tell them it's okay to to be afraid. It's okay to to cry. It's okay to to um, not be friends with this person because that person won't be friends with you. And it's being able to tell them, you know, when you graduate from high school, you're probably not going to see ten percent of these people ever in your life again. Really, really. I'm rare. I'm friends with a lot of my high school friends, but I made the effort to be friends with them. And the same with my with my students. I've I've got students from all over the world, from from Russia, China, Korea, Romania. And when I am able to contact them, when I'm able to see them, I let them know, hey, you know, you're still part of KMG Martial Arts because there's a lot of people out there who, when you run into problems, they will drop you like a hot potato. And that's not real life. That's not real life. Standing behind somebody. Not when it's all when everything is wonderful and smooth and creamy and cool. Are you going to walk with them when when they're having a serious serious problem? Are you going to walk with them when their father has committed suicide? Are you going to stand there? Or are you going to stand away from them because you don't want to help them deal with a problem? I mean, I, I've 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 done I've I've had to deal with those issues, so it's not new to me anymore. I, I've I've had black belts die. I've had students die. Uh, death is a part of life. Does it stink? Oh, yeah, it does. It absolutely does. And it does it get easier? Never. Ever. But each day is going to be more tolerable. And that's what you have to make sure that they understand. Live to fight another day. And if you can't live for 24 hours, go for 48. Can't go for 48, go for 72. But whatever you do, do not give up. It's worth it. Storms don't last all day. And it's not if a storm's coming, it's when. But when the storm comes, sometimes they need somebody to stand there in front of them, stand beside them, or stand behind them. But as long as you're standing with them, that's what makes all the difference in the world. Nobody, I'm not into fly-by-night relationships. I've known people for 30, 40 years in the martial arts. That's, that's what we do. That's what we are. And some of those people I haven't talked to in years, they can call me today and say, hey, I'm having an issue with this. I said, you know what? I get off work in five minutes. I'll be there. Yeah. Certainly as martial artists, we build some pretty powerful friendships. And, and those friendships do oftentimes seem to occupy a different space than non-martial arts relationships. You know, you talked about the the duration that those friendships can exist and non-martial arts relationships don't seem to last that long without constant contact. You know, I can think of 
martial arts friends that I haven't spoken to in, in a decade or two that I could call up and say, hey, I managed to track down your number. Can we chat? And they would say yes. And then I have plenty of non-martial arts friends that I haven't spoken to in a year that I still have their number. I could text them and they would never write back because we haven't been in front of each other and, and they're going to look at my number come up and think that it's just plain weird. Right. So let's switch gears a little bit. In that okay. last bit you gave us, you alluded to some of the the lower sides of life, death, challenges, suicide. And we've all been through that kind of stuff. You know, some of us fortunately haven't experienced a lot of it. Others have been through quite a bit, but whatever it is, we all go through challenges. And, and in the moment, those significant challenges always feel like all consuming. Tell us about a time of your life where you had some sort of challenge and how your experience as a martial artist helped you move past it. Oh, this is going to be a tough one. Um, in 2003, I was diagnosed with viral meningitis with viral encephalitis. One in 1,000 people get that at the same time, and usually it's fatal. Um, spent a lot of time in the hospital. Um, went to the hospital here, and they did what they could. And they released me. I'm being self-employed. I didn't have health insurance. My mom had to come up here when she was living. She had to come up here and take me home with her to McAllister. Thank God for godly moms. Because somewhere in there, my aunt is in the medical field. My sister's in the medical field. And my mom called my aunt and said, he stopped talking. And she called my mom, my sister and said, something's wrong. He has stopped talking. And she took me to the hospital in McAllister, but they didn't have a neurologist. McAllister's a small town. My uncle came to the hospital and transported me back to Oklahoma City. When we get to, I mean, I'm, I'm, totally out, totally gone. Um, if you tell me the conversation that we had, I'll remember it, but I don't remember anything. My uncle, my, I don't know how I got to the hospital. My brother just so happened to show up at my mom's house and he got me in the car to take me to the hospital. My uncle showed up at the hospital. He got me in the car to take me back to Oklahoma city, back to Oklahoma city. Um, I, I can't tell you where I was. I just wasn't here. And um, my mom is probably five foot five, maybe 110 pounds, but the, the sweetest Christian lady you ever want to meet until her son's sick and you didn't take care of her. So I had this vision in my head to where the conversation went something like, he was here before, and my mom said, yes, and you released him. From then on, I got FEMO treatment. Well, the nurses are coming on and they're, and, and they're, they're trying to get a response. And I, I, I got my medical report. Patient does not recognize mom. Patient does not recognize sister. Patient is not responsive. Pa I mean, it was just over and over and over. And we had just lost one of our black belts. And I can't tell you where I was spiritually, but I, I remember my prayer was, okay, God, let's, let's don't drag this thing on. We just lost Matthew LeBeau. If you're going to take me to heaven, just take me. But if you're going to keep me here, I humbly request that you heal me from the tips of my hair to the soles of my feet. I don't want to have any ailments or anything. I want to be bigger, stronger, badder than I was before. And my church, Avery Chapel Amy Church in Oklahoma City, had a 24-hour prayer vigil for me where somebody either sat with me for two hours or prayed for me for two hours constantly. Now, I'm going to digress just for a moment. I love Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley is an awesome uh, minister. I love John MacArthur. MacArthur is an awesome minister. You need to be plugged into a local church because they're not coming. And my Sunday school teacher 
came up to, to, to sit with me for two hours. And God kept telling her to bring me this cross. And she was like, you know, I don't have time to do that. We don't know if Brother Kevin's going to be alive or what. We don't know what in the world's going on. I got to get to the hospital. Thank God she was obedient. She's coming, and the nurses had just come and, and did their test and everything on time to see if I'm responsive. And uh, Sister Cooksey pulls out this cross, and I look at it, and I say, praise God, and been talking ever since. Now, Sister Cooksey about fell out of her chair because I hadn't talked in like a week or two since then, I mean, before then. She runs down to the nurse's station, and they are they are like, uh, they, you know, we were just down there. He said, no, he's talking. And so nurses come back and say, Kevin, Kevin, do you know where you are? And I was like, well, obviously I'm in the hospital because I'm in a hospital bed. So, okay, something has happened. I don't know what. Uh, do you know what day it is? I was like, okay, this big old huge hospital and you guys don't have a calendar? You know, what's that all about? <laughs> and then I raised the covers and I see that I have a decatheter. And I freak totally out. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What have you guys done? What have you guys done? They were like, calm down, calm down. You've been unconscious for a long time. This was necessary for, for you to be able to have your go to the restroom. It's not, I said, this is not permanent. This is not permanent. Whew. Okay, we're good. And so just through that and when I see people go through physical therapy, because I had to go through physical therapy because the atrophy had set in, and so I didn't have control of my body. And the nurse is walking me down the hall, and she's like, okay, I want you to walk to the, to the door and walk back. And I say, okay. So I take off walking, and in my mind, I'm going, stop, 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 stop. And I go, bam, right into the door. <laughs> and she's like, oh, my God. Okay, note to self. You look strong, but you're not strong. I said, you're my physical therapist. You didn't want me to a door. What else do I, can I look forward to? That was uh, the end of 2003. It took all of 2004 for me to get my health back. That is why I am so adamant about being well, being healthy. If there's something I can help you do to be healthy, I'm your man because I've done the physical therapy. I've been in the hospital not knowing who you are. I've, I've, I've done all of that. Not a lot of fun. If God signs me up for that, okay, I'll, I'll do it. But I'm not signing me up for that again. That, that, was, that was not a lot of fun. And what I did was I said, okay, God, where are we? And he said, you're at 25%, okay? And, and I'd work a little bit and say, okay, where are you? Uh, okay, you're at your 30%. And he did that steadily for me because I, need I needed to have a gauge to see where I was. Am I getting better? And I went to a tournament way too early. I went to a tournament and they recognized I'd been in the hospital. And I had a young lady walk up to me and she said, you couldn't have had viral meningitis or viral encephalitis. I was like, well, yeah, kind of did. And she's like, it took me a year to learn how to walk because me and another lady were in the same room and she is in a nursing home because she has the, uh, they were both 46. And she, she's in a nursing home because she has the mentality of a six-year-old. I'm like, wow. Because really, it wasn't until I got out of the hospital and was released, totally re released and able to, to do things that I realized how sick I was. And just, you know, you do your forms over and over and over and over and over it wasn't so bad that I had to learn to walk again, but it was it was one of those things where you had to reacquaint yourself with walking because atrophy had set in. You had to reacquaint yourself with hand movements, um, simple things, going to the restroom. So all of those practices that you do in your form, that you do up and down the floor, down block, uh, lunge punch, all those repetitions allow you to do the same thing when you have had a catastrophic illness. You know, we've had others on the show who have overcome serious, um, you know, statistically catastrophic conditions, you know, and, and I, I don't, 
want to speak for you as to you know where where your mind might might have been in terms of how close you were to taking a a step on another journey right um right. you know i'm i'm thinking about a gentleman that we spoke with on episode 92 uh master scott pribble who you know i, I think his the, the survivability of of the condition that he ended up with was 1 in 10,000 uh, and he has wow. some anomaly to the point where they're studying him now because he shouldn't be alive. You know, and you talked about what you went through and there, there's someone else that'll be coming on the show that, um, you know, pretty much a 95, 96% recovery on something that most people don't get back more than 50 or 60% is my understanding. So there's something here, right? There's something about a life of martial arts training that makes us more resilient. Now, I don't want you to speak for them. I don't want you to speak for anyone but yourself. What was it about your training? Now, obviously, there's a mental component and there's a physical component. And you talked a little bit about the spiritual component from your faith. If you were to, let's say, write a prescription for young people today, and how to use martial arts to become more resilient towards any physical ailment that could hit them. Or, or if you can answer it in a different way, if that feels more appropriate. What lesson do we take from what you went through? Do your forms. Practice, practice, practice. Everybody's tired of Chung Ji. And we had this conversation in class last night. Guess what the first form of your black belt test is going to be? Chung Ji. Do your forms. Grandmaster Huang are always instilled this. If you want to be a good fighter, do your forms. If you want to be a great fighter, do your forms every day. The repetition of doing it over and over and over and over cannot be it cannot be measured because when the physical therapist says, um, you need to squeeze this ball ten times and after twenty five, thirty times, they're like, Oh my goodness, what no, it's okay. It's okay. This is just like doing Chung Ji. When the physical therapist says you've got to extend that leg on a leg extension machine 10 times and you're going, I'm not doing it 10 times. I'm doing it 12 times. I'm doing it 13 times. I'm doing it 14 times. Always do one more, always do a little bit better because doing your forms over and over and over is how when someone attacks, you have a knee jerk reaction. The knee jerk reaction has form. It's not something out of the blue. It is form. So in my opinion, Practice, practice, practice. You can't practice your forms enough. You can't practice your basics enough. Do your forms, and that's what gives you the, I don't know what the word is I'm searching for. That's that's what gets you through because you're not going to do your forms enough. You never can. I've been doing Chung Ji for over 20 years, and it's still not good. My student thinks it's wonderful. That's wonderful. It's still not good enough for me. Do your forms. And not just your basic forms. If if you did your forms every day, just think of what type of martial artist you could be. Yeah. Not every other day, not every third day, every day. If you can do that, you're going to be an incredible martial artist. You just are. And you don't have to tell anybody. They'll see. Repetition, practice. Forms. It, there's, there's, there's not any shortcuts. And we we had talked earlier. It's not if a storm is coming; it's when. That will prepare you for the storms of life, so that you can get through it. Will it stink? Absolutely, absolutely. But you'll get through it. You absolutely get through it. And when you get through a storm, it's kind of like, well, that wasn't fun. But I got through it. I totally got through it. And then, then you'll help others right. do the same thing. Right. I appreciate you sharing that. And clearly that's a difficult memory, a, d- a difficult time that you went through, you and your, your family. And I expect your school and, and everyone that you knew. So thank you for being so open about that. And I hope that people out there that, I've had struggles of their own. You know, the reason that that I asked this question is because I want people to realize that 
not only do all of us go through difficult times, and I'm, I'm trying to, to help people understand that, you know, if the guests that we have on the show can get through some of these really difficult things, and it runs the gamut. We've had people that have talked about things that, to them, in, in the moment, were absolutely catastrophic. And, and, and I don't mean any disrespect to anyone that, that's come on, so I'm not even going to mention any specifics. But there are some stories that we hear that I think some of the listeners might listen to and say, well, you know, that's that's not that bad. And especially when you compare it to a near-death experience or the untimely loss of a child, you know, we've heard both of those stories. Mm. In the moment when people are experiencing it, it's all consuming. And so if all of these folks that we've had on can overcome that, listeners, you can too. And the discipline that we learn from martial arts, from from forms, from basics, from whatever it is, you know, there there's a way through. And I like the part that you kind of tacked on at the end there about helping others, because I think that's so critical. Once we have the perspective of being able to overcome a challenge, that there's a, a bit of responsibility, if you can, to help someone else going through something troublesome, because most of us didn't get through our troubled times alone. Right. Now, you've mentioned a couple people that have been pretty important in your life, a couple of instructors. Now, I want to take them out. Because we've heard about them, we've heard and we understand why they were so important to you. But of all the people left in your life that have had some influence on your martial arts, who's been the most influential and why? Mm. Well, it's going to kind of sound cliche, but it's probably my father. Because he was so adamant about me not taking martial arts. Oh, this is a different direction than we've heard. Um, well, um, the history is my father fought in World War II and the Korean War. And me doing a Korean art, he, he was like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, um, I'm, I'm not back then at 16. I'm not grasping the full concept of what he's talking about. I'm taking martial arts. He's like, you're, you, you know that we, we, that was, was the Korean War. You, you understand? I was like, yeah. Uh, so, so it was, it was kind of disrespectful on my part because I didn't connect the dots. And one of the best compliments I've ever received in my entire life was when my father said, you know what? You're really good at this. You have to be good. You, you, you keep bringing home trophies. You, you, your, your mom doesn't know what to do, do with them all. They're, they're, they're all over the place. Um, and uh, he mentioned a specific young man that, uh, that I had helped and how he was growing and thriving. And I was like, wow, I didn't think anybody was noticing. I was just doing it because it's the right thing to do. And he, I mean, he went from being very, very, very uncomfortable with me taking a Korean art to supporting me in my Korean art and my martial arts. And I mean, my, my parents have already gone, but I, I could not, that was a shot in the arm that was totally unexpected. And that, that gives me the drive and determination to keep going. Powerful stuff. Now, we've talked about competition today in a couple different respects, but tell us about your philosophy on competition, when and why you started competing. Maybe there's a, another competition story that you'd like to share. Just, you know, give us, give us some of that stuff. I like competition. <clears throat> Excuse me. Competition is just a different training arena. Uh, here's my definition competition, you have exactly 120 seconds in sparring to find your opponent's weak spot, hammer away at it, and at the same time, hide your own. So that's not a lot of time. If you've got a good center judge who allows you to actually engage, then you might have 90 seconds of fighting. If you have a slow center judge, then you're going to have 60 seconds of fighting. 
and it is the it is the next best thing to controlled chaos because you have to find your opponent's weak spot and score and keep from being scored upon. All it is is a different arena. That's where you learn if your sidekick really works because it's a total stranger. The first time you fight this guy is the first time you fight this guy. And so I like competition. Um, in the new millennia, I don't know that the students see the value in competition, but you're fighting a total stranger. Can you, can your concepts and principles work against this person or can they not? And it's not the judge's fault that you lost. It's not the other competitor's fault that you lost. How about this? How about getting with your instructor, training a little bit harder, and see if you can get better? It's not any, there's only one person on this earth you can control, and that's you. So I like competition. Um, after viral meningitis with viral encephalitis in 2003, all of 2004 to get my health back, in 2005, I won the USA World Championship in sparring. And that was probably, we had trained really hard, and that was probably one, one of the, the, the highlights in my martial arts career. And in another fight um, against Shinoshi Williams uh, in IMAC, International Martial Arts Council, it's the first one to five. Hands are one point. Kicks are two points. No, uh, uh, they have East and West Coast. East Coast growing kick is allowed. West Coast growing kick is not allowed. And so I don't remember what division we were fighting. But we were 4-4. We were four, four. And once again, I'm going to rely on my trusty back fist to try to end the match. And I had telegraphed it to as soon, as soon as I pushed off, uh, to hit Shinoshi Williams with a back fist, he hits me with, in the back of the head with a, with a, a hook kick. And I look around like, y'all didn't see that, right? Y'all didn't see that, right? And I mean, it had to have been a good fight because the ring behind us, the ring in front of us, and the ring beside us stopped. And everybody was watching what we were doing. And I mean... It, like I said, some of my story, it's, I lost, but it's okay. It, 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 was, it was a good fight. And as long as you perform, as long as you do well, it's okay. It's okay. And certainly as human beings, we tend to learn a lot more from our mistakes than our victories. I don't know about you. I don't know. It, maybe you're different in that respect, but I know that when I mess up, I have a lot more to take away than when things go the way I wanted them to. And, you know, some of the judges, when you win, you say, okay, what do I need to work on, sir? You won. Right. But what do I need to work on? You won. Well, thank you. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. surely you didn't just, just, you know, did you see the heavens open up and, ah, oh, you know, you can give me something I can work out, work on. It's okay. I, I, I'm a big boy. I, I can take it. But when I lose, I'm like, okay, uh, we look at the video. Okay. You're, you're got your hands a little bit down. Uh, your stance is too big. We, we go over all these little, little micro things that we can work on and we start working on them. I mean, that's the fun part. I mean, you go home and you, and you train and you work and you work on your endurance and you work on your kicks and everything. And then you're like, okay, I've got my endurance, but I'm, I still got to learn the, the concepts and principles of combat. How can I get him to do what I want him to do? It's, it's, to me, it's just a game. At the end of the match, when everything goes double zeros, you should be able to shake hands, go eat pizza, go hang out, find out how they started training, tell how you started training, and enjoy life you'll find out that that person that, that you, you really didn't like is really cool. It's really cool. You just didn't get a chance to know him. Right. Awesome. Now you've had the chance to work with some wonderful people over your career, compete against them, train under them, train alongside them, probably even teach some of them. But if you could work out, train with someone that you haven't, be they alive or dead anywhere in the world, who would that be? And why? I thought about this a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm a member of the uh, K-1 
Kenny Briscoe Wild Bucks Association. We lost Bob last year, uh, and John Watley has taken Bob's place in pushing the Wild Bucks organization forward. But we recently call it Kenny Briscoe. It's uh, Bob Kenny, Billy Briscoe. And Billy Briscoe is a Gojiru guy, and he is absolutely phenomenal. And because Bob had such a huge presence with the Wild Bunch, he kind of overshadowed Billy to where Bob said we do. And that's okay. But after Bob had passed, I realized that we really haven't given Billy the respect that he is due. And so we have a summer camp every year, right about uh, June. And when I'm not in Vegas, I, I, I go. And we are now starting to work on Gojuru basic forms so that I can include the Gojuru basics in my system. We teach Taekwondo, we teach Kung Fu, and we teach Jiu-Jitsu. But there's no reason why we should not teach Goju-Ru because Billy is a phenomenal Goju-Ru practitioner. And I, I mean, I want to let him know, and I, I did let him know, and I apologize. We have really kind of taken you for granted. You've always been here. Now it's time for us to have a huge appreciation for the things that you've accomplished and things that you've done. And so I would choose Billy. Br I mean, there, there's, there's several. I would choose Billy Briscoe. Um, I would choose uh, Grandmaster Hong because he is who I first started with under Phil Perkins. And if I can choose one more, I would choose Brett Jackson. Um, I started martial arts when I was 16. Brett was five or six. We are still friends. I'm 56. He's 46. We are still friends today. He ran some very successful schools in uh, West Palm Beach, Beach, Florida. And he is now located in Stillwater, Oklahoma. To sit back with him and reunite with him as a student, that would be beyond awesome because we, we have known each other for, for 40 years. That would, time is the only thing keeping us from doing that. And when time allows us, I will make that happen. I will make that happen. It's clear how much reverence you have for those people and really for for everybody, I mean, you, you've spoken very highly of, of a number of people today, and it's nice to talk to someone that has so much respect for all of those that came before and, and, and even after. You know, respect is such a part of the martial arts, and it's clear that that's an integral part for you, and I'm guessing for the way that you teach your students. I, I try because I, I want them to understand that. It, well, I want them to understand that it's not, it's, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't want to know you for a minute. Mm. I don't want to know you for an hour. I want to know you. And if you, I mean, if you choose to keep, even if you don't choose to train with me, if you choose to go somewhere else in, in my latter years, it's not about me. It's about martial arts. And so I can promote me. Awesome. But if I'm not the school for you, I'll help you find the school that you need to be in because I want you to continue to train. And it, it's not about style. I, you can see an Aikido guy beat up a, beat up a, a Kung Fu guy because he took, his, he took his art serious. The Kung Fu guy didn't. It's not, it's, it's not about that. It's not about style. It's about the instructor. Is he giving you things to work on? Is he showing you a path to a better life? Or is he taking your money? Right. Because there are schools out there that do that. And I'm not mad at you. I want to have a relationship with my students. I want my students in this past, present, and future. I've had students come to my karate school and, and say, Mr. Galloway, uh, I need some help. Okay? Do you need a shoulder to cry on? 
I need me to fix something. I need to show the crowd. Okay, come on to the back. We'll, we'll go back in the back and crowd, crowd until, until we don't have any more tears. If that makes you feel better, then we're good. But if you want me to fix it, you're going to have to listen to me. You can't fix it with the, on the path that you're doing now. You can't fix it and still be on drugs. You can't fix it and be hooked on alcohol. You just can't. When you're ready, I'll walk with you every step of the way. But you got to be ready. You got to be ready. Earlier on in our conversation, we heard you mention Bruce Lee. And so now let's talk about movies and, and entertainment. You know, Do you have any favorite martial arts movies? Are you a martial arts movie guy? I am. Uh, I like Jackie Chan. He, he's, you know, incredible. Gently incredible. But when you look at the movies, these are all guys who took their martial arts seriously. They were martial artists first yeah. before they were movie actors. Chuck Norris, I've never had the pleasure to meet him. I have had the pleasure to meet Bill Superfoot Wallace, um, uh, Hoyce Gracie. I've, I've had the, the pleasure to meet these guys. But they were all number one in their craft. So I, if you ask any of my karate kids, what are video games? What are movies? They are entertainment. That's all it is. That's not real life. It's entertainment. And you should be entertained. Pay your $9, go to the movies, get some popcorn, have a great time. But I like these guys because they were number one in their craft. That's the hard work they put towards the martial arts art was rewarding to them. And that's what I like. Um, as far as movies and books, uh, one book I really enjoy is called Zen and the Martial Arts uh, by Joe... Hyams. Uh, yes, yes. That is a really good book. It is. That is a really good book. And it's, it's not very big. It's, it's not, it's not going to be an all-day reader. But some of the information that you get in there, if you just read it slowly and contemplate and think about what he's trying to say, incredible. I tell, I tell all my students, anybody can do what Bruce Lee does. No, they can't. Sure they can. And the example I give them is, how many times have you used a doorknob? What are you talking about? How many times are you trapped in your room because you didn't know how to operate the doorknob? Never. Right. How many times, tell me a number, how many times you've used a doorknob? Well, it, it, it's uncountable. That's what Bruce Lee did. He worked and he worked and he worked and he worked and he modified and he fixed and he worked and he worked. Same way you can reach, grab the doorknob and not even look at it. You can close the door behind you and not even look behind you. That repetition is exactly what Bruce Lee did. Very powerful. And that book, we've talked about that book on the show before. It's it's definitely... Have you really? Oh, yeah. I, I think... Um... And it's it's up, and I'll link to it from the show notes. We compiled out of the first hundred and something episodes. Hasn't been updated, but it probably will after the two hundredth. Uh, the top ten books that have been recommended by our guests, and Zen and the Martial Arts, I believe, is top three. Uh, wow! It was my first martial arts book. Uh, certainly, the one that has been most formative on on me because I read it when I was so young. So, an absolutely incredible book. It is a short read. I know I've said this before. If you haven't read it, please get it. It's like $8. Um, it, it's it's a good bathroom book if you're that kind of a person because the chapters are organized <laughs> fairly short. And we won't talk more about that. <laughs> <laughs> so what's keeping you going? You're still training. Clearly, you still love the martial arts. You have more. It sounds like that you're you're trying to do. So what is it that's keeping Mr. Kevin Galloway moving forward? Oh, for me personally, <clears throat> excuse me, it is striving for perfection. Like I said, I don't think that's a bad thing. It does have its limits. You can't drive yourself crazy with it. It's not ever going to be perfect. You have to understand that. But 
I want to throw, I believe God teases you with a perfect technique. Um, uh, we do um, the scrimmers, collies, uh, in, in Kung Fu we call them suguans, and in a scrimmers, uh, there's a thing called retic, where I was at home uh, working on one of my mom's huge oak trees, and I just couldn't, they had exposed it to us at the martial arts camp, and I just couldn't get it. And I was like, man, this is just not working. And I relaxed one time and did a retic, and the bark flew off the tree like someone had shot it with a shotgun. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. And I've always strived to do it that way again. Have I ever done it that way again? No. No. Years and years and years. No. But it, it was like, oh, I've, I've, got, I've got to keep trying. And so I want to throw the perfect sidekick. I want to throw the perfect roundhouse. I want to throw the perfect donger, the, per- the perfect back fist. I want to throw the per- – and be- I-, I told my guys that I'll retire when I enter into a tournament like the USA World Championship, and I go through the entire lot of them and never get touched. That's when I'll retire. Well, that's impossible. It is impossible, but that's okay. That's okay. So, I, I mean – learning, teaching, learning, teaching, giving, being able to help this child with his sidekick so that it becomes easier and faster for him, so that it becomes a part of his arsenal. Being able to help this young man who is a little bit overweight, mind your manners, do the things that I've asked you to do, and the weight starts dropping off. Being able to Tell that young lady, you know what? You are being bullied. Be the bigger person. You are being bullied. Well, you are being bullied. You don't feel like you are being bullied. Be the bigger person. Uh, Does she work out? No. Makes you want to sidekick her in the face, doesn't it? Yes. Don't do it. Show grace. Show mercy. That's what you are doing. She doesn't get it. You get it. And being able to help my students be the absolute best that they can be whether it's martial arts, football, basketball, track, it doesn't make any difference. Just being able to help them physically, mentally, spiritually to be good, solid citizens. So the conversations that we have are meaningful. They're not always getting me out of trouble. Absolutely great stuff. So if people out there listening want to get a hold of you, they want to, you know, bring you out for a, you know, I don't know if you, if you do seminars or maybe they're passing through Oklahoma and they want to look you up and drop by and train with you. I mean, are those options? Are there other options? You know, this is what we call our guest commercial time. So let's hear it. Oh, uh, my school is in Yukon, 519 West Main in Yukon. Uh, phone number is 405-354-4949. Uh, Nobody's going to be at the karate school until after four. Uh, my personal cell phone number is area code 405-990-5756. Um, if you let me know who you are, when you are, where you are, I'll, I'll let you know what we're doing. And if we're at home that weekend, then come on by and hang out and talk, and, and I'll get pizza or we'll work out or I'll show you one of my favorite techniques. You show me your favorite techniques and the application thereof because it should be an exchange. It shouldn't be just me spouting orders. Um, we have a tournament in the always last weekend in February, uh, the Yukon Karate Championship, um, February 25th, 2017. We, we are a IMAX sanctioned tournament. We, uh, have over 300 divisions, including East coast sparring, West coast sparring, continuous sparring, uh, gi and no gi grappling, uh, sport MMA, um, Traditional forms, open forms, extreme forms, weapons, I mean, musicals. We, we, we pretty much got pretty much what you, anything that you want to do. And, and it's, just, it's just mainly bringing a group of martial artists together so they can perform at their utmost best. And then let's, 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 let's leave and, and, and enjoy the time afterwards. Uh, this new this year is going to be self-defense. You're going to have five techniques that you're going to have to uh, a push, a kick, a grab, and then two other things. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You do the first, you do the first one slow, then you do the next one fast. 
last year we kind of kind of messed up. We had breaking, but I wasn't very fair to the gentleman who was running breaking. So we're going to do breaking event again this year and make sure that we have everything that you need to have breaking. So it's just a good time, good martial artist. I, 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 I can't say enough because the, the number one issue with most tournaments is you don't have enough judges. And we usually have enough judges to keep everything moving. And that, that in by itself is a blessing. And anyone that has run an event or spent a significant amount of time at events knows that the people who treat everyone well are the ones that get a lot of referees. So the fact that you have a good number of butts in chairs, so to speak, says a lot about your character and what you've given back to the martial arts in your community. So thank you. And I'm sure that people listening or that might be listening from your area would, are probably nodding their heads at this point. At least I hope so, because you seem like a good guy. I mean, we, we haven't met yet in person, but I hope that that happens sometime soon. Is there a website for that tournament for anyone that might be interested? There is. It's Yukon Karate, uh, www.yukonkaratechampionship.com. Okay. Um, and then uh, www.kmgmartialarts.com. On the Yukon Karate Championship, we left off the S. So it's championship. It doesn't have an S. So... That's how you tell us from everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we'll have links to these websites at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We haven't talked about the fact that all of this stuff is going to be in the show notes, uh, quotes, and, and we'll get some photos from you and, and links to these things over there because sometimes people are listening when they're in the car, and that makes it tough. So if you are one of those folks, you want to look up some of this stuff, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. When you are not driving, we do not condone websites and driving let alone texting and driving so right you can, you can you can check all that out over there well let's take it out on a high note any parting advice for those listening practice 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 there are no shortcuts in martial arts there's just not practice 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 um make sure your instructor cares about you there's a few that 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 don't and that's okay. Just find someone that does. And um, for me personally, I appreciate what you and Whistle Kick are doing. We need more martial artists talking to martial artists. And I've looked at the roster of the people that you have interviewed. Phenomenal. Thank you. Absolutely phenomenal. And this is what we need. We need people talking. Um, I'll say it again. There is no superior martial art. There's just not. You keep working. You keep training. You keep doing the things that you know to do. And it will come. It will come. Whether it's going to be weapons, forms, fighting. Everybody's not going to be a, a great fighter. But everybody can learn the concepts and principles of combat so that you can protect yourself because sometimes it's not a nice world out there. But you can do it. The only person stopping you is you. Mr. Galloway is that type of instructor that I'd want my kids studying with if I had any. He clearly embodies the spirit of martial arts, and his students are very lucky to have him. Thank you so much, Mr. Galloway, for your time on the show today. Over at WhistleKickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with photos, links, and titles to everything we discussed. There's also a place to sign up for the newsletter. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram with the username WhistleKick. You should also check out our Facebook group, WhistleKick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. Just today, I posted a message asking for introductions to people of particular styles. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to come on or recommend someone else, maybe your instructor or somebody you know with great stories, head over to the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you have feedback, we'd love to hear that, and you can do so on the website as well. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing, and if you're up for giving something back, that could include sharing the show with friends, leaving reviews, joining the newsletter list, getting in on that Facebook group, liking Whistlekick on Facebook, or making a purchase. Every one of those is a great way to help us out so we can continue to do more things for you. Check out the new Horizon Sparring Gear colorway. If you like it, grab some soon, because we're expecting this first run to sell out very quickly. If you're a school owner or team coach, remember wholesale.whistlekick.com. 
Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.